Hello, lovely podcast people. Uh, this is another intro to the second half of my guest appearance. Um, so, yes, I won't bore you with too many details, but Jeff and I discuss uh, a topic that I have discussed in part here on the podcast a long, long time ago. But the concept of bulking, some of the myths around that, some things that maybe you're not aware of in terms of what the evidence actually says about calories and bulking and what you should do, what some of the drawbacks of uh, calorie surpluses that maybe seem quite moderate, but actually when you look at the mathematical situation that you're creating um, and the energy requirements for muscle gain and um, the leftover, let's say, going towards fat mass, you can gain fat very, very quickly um, despite feeling like what you're doing is a relatively moderate approach. So, yes, we discussed that. And um, just quickly, I was made aware that in, because this is a, a slightly old podcast, the enrollment dates for Emma knew that I discussed were wrong. So anyone who was confused by that, Enrolments for MNU for uh, 2024 um, open on the, uh, I think it's 18th of June. I'm, I'm pretty certain it's 18th of June. I've got it written here and I don't know if it's a three or an eight. But anyway, yes, it was wrong in that last podcast. So, yeah, if you're interested in that. And I will just say at the time of this going out, we're just about to launch the uh, prerequisite course for 2024. So anyone who wants to do the prerequisite course so that they can do MNU this year, you can get in contact with us as usual on MNU at mac-nutrition.com. Um, anything else for me to say? I think that's everything. I hope you enjoy this podcast. Uh, next podcast coming up is going to be a really good one uh, with some... Uh, another seminal paper. It's a little bit of an older seminal paper, but one that uh, I think is worth going into because of lots of the misinformation that's been shouted about in the industry at the minute around insulin, and carbohydrates, processed foods, uh, calories. So yes, give you some good understanding. Those of you who are coaches and educators as well, you can take that away. Uh, to re-educate people on all the misinformation by the big shouty people with large followings and um, yeah so I'll see you back for that one but anyway I hope you uh, enjoyed this one in the meantime much love and so I did want to uh, kind of transition here and kind of talk to you about the topic I wanted to uh, bring up today. And, and this was a podcast I heard you talk about, I think it was maybe like a year ago. I think I, I've listened to it two or three times the last couple of weeks. So I think it was episode 28 oh, cool. of your podcast. Um, and I thought it was awesome because this is uh, kind of related to some things I've been talking about lately. And it's why women shouldn't balk. And I know you kind of mentioned that you like in that episode, you wanted to have a title that was kind of attention grabbing, right? And I feel like that definitely, edgy. yes, edgy. And I feel like it definitely is that. So if you maybe want to kind of uh, talk about the, the background of this topic and, and why you thought it was important, then we can kind of roll from there with it. Yeah, so the <clears throat> the background for it was that I just had a spate of individuals contacting me with much the same message. And I, to this day, still don't know exactly where it came from, but it was... I guess, individuals of a particular demographic, let's say um, females in and around, let's say 30 to 50, that had been tracking calories, losing weight, et cetera, et cetera, and hadn't necessarily achieved their goal in terms of body composition, um, the look that maybe they were striving for um not necessarily the body weight it was never the body weight it was more yeah the look uh and maybe the maybe some level i wanted to lose this much weight but either way and the the message that i just kept hearing was and it was this word that just struck me bulk i i want to go on a bulk <laughs> and I, it was so uh what's the word it was so alien to me to have because the the people who i see using bulk and hear using bulk are like 
guys in their 20s oh, i'm doing a bulk I, you know it's it was so alien to me that i had a 40 year old going and female going i want a bulk and you know again not saying that any woman of 40 shouldn't want a bulk or and but the problem is it's the word bulk like gain muscle okay probably wouldn't have stuck out like a sore thumb to me so i didn't know where they were getting it and then it was this idea i need to i want to bulk because i want to gain some muscle because i think i for instance need to gain some muscle to boost my metabolism or i need to go on a, a muscle gain phase or, or, or on this bulk or this you know all muscle gain phase so that i can then lose more fat or so so i can look a certain way like i've lost fat I've lost X kilograms or pounds, but I don't quite look the way. So I think what I need is more muscle so I can look like, and, you know, occasionally people will send you a picture of who they're trying to look like. And, you know, often it's like someone who is using drugs and this person's not, which is always, uh, you know, um, a bit, I just you just feel bad pointing it out right like yep. look you're never going to look like that <laughs> it's um uh, i i re i remember when i first realized that i without drugs there was not hope in hell like you know nowadays i'd be like even if i took all the drugs under the sun i still wouldn't look the way i wanted i want to look because you know genetics and and muscle insertions and just stuff like that is like you know, Flex Wheeler, who I mentioned earlier, is like one of the most bodybuilding perfect physiques on the planet. Like um, there's people who take all the drugs and still don't look anything like him because of, because of the way he's put together. But anyway, having to say to someone like, so I remember when I first found out and it killed, it killed my motivation for training. Um, and so saying to someone like, look, and I don't always jump to the drugs thing. I just go, this, this person is so lean it's not the fact they have more muscle than you it's they're so lean so male or female it's like and but it but in this instance it was like oh you see that see that bit on her deltoid there they, or the, her shoulder see that line i don't have that and i'm like it's because she's so lean um not because like yeah she has more muscle than you but you put on that muscle and you you're still going to not be able to see that you're just going to appear bigger and so this was the reason for the for the podcast of and i think i called it why women shouldn't bulk um and it 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 ended up not being necessarily specific to women because it's hard to define the word bulk but i very often think it's fair to assume that when people talk about bulk, that you're talking about cons gaining a considerable amount of weight. You And you're almost, I feel like if you talked about averages, the average meaning of that word, because we don't have a dictionary definition of what that means, but I, f I feel like, and I think most people wouldn't agree with me, you'll take the usual meaning as, we're going to accept a certain level of fat gain along with some muscle gain. Uh, uh, would you tend to agree? Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. I definitely think when somebody cool. hears bulk, they think, yeah, some, some weight gain, like a substantial amount of weight gain with, they know that there's going to be some, some fat gain involved too. Yeah. And, and I'm not always sure the the women who were messaging me this necessarily were on board with that idea that they were going to gain some fat, but either way they were going to up their calories because they were currently dieting and they were going to go into a muscle gain phase. And I think, you know, I'm going to put on two or three kilos and probably assuming that the majority of that would be muscle gain, for instance. And then that was going to dramatically transform their physique. And my message essentially is when we dial stuff back and we look at, realistic rates of muscle gain as as one part of our equation and then number two what's required for muscle gain and you there, I, it still blows my mind that there's people out there going you can't gain muscle in a deficit because we know that's categorically incorrect um you, you know it, it, it's unequivocal 
that it can happen. I'm not saying it's optimal and I'm not saying it's easy, um, but it can happen. You know, people go, you can't build a house without bricks is an incorrect analogy to use because you can build muscle without exogenous intake of energy above your total daily energy expenditure, which is what we're talking about in a deficit. Like maybe if you were far, if, if you were fasting, you couldn't gain muscle because you're not, but in muscle gain, the bricks are the protein. It's not energy, um, but you may gain muscle slower and it may be inefficient and, and this, that, and the other. So, so on one side of the equation, and you've got loads of research to go, it's suboptimal to try and gain muscle in a deficit. Like we, we can all agree that I think I, it would be, I mean, I'm sure someone crazy out there, some carnivore diet guy will come out with something crazy saying that you can or whatever, but uh, you know, we can all agree it's, it's suboptimal. The, the discussion becomes is a calorie surplus more optimal than maintenance. And it may surprise your listeners to hear that we don't have the studies doing like it's almost this thing to gain muscle optimally you have to be in a surplus like we don't have a study that shows us that unequivocally we we don't have all the control all the studies that we have that have controlled this have looked at the uh, deficits in gaining muscle and we you know we have other studies of overfeeding loads of studies in loads of different realms that have looked at lean body mass, but we don't have these studies that, that where we have comparison groups, like a randomized control trial with, with one group, you know, with matched protein intakes. And the only significant difference between our groups at the start of the study and du the duration of the study that we're controlling for is their energy intake. We don't have those studies. So all we're basing these, uh, uh, this idea that we need to be in a surplus on is I guess conjecture. And it, I, I'm still on board with the idea. You, you probably want to try and be in a bit of a surplus, but, but then you, you still have this discussion. People will go, well, you know, if I'm training hard, then I'll, then I, then don't I need more calories? And, and I'm like, yeah, definitely. How, how much more training are you going to do a week? Okay. Well, I'm going to do, an extra bit of training, some more reps, an extra session. I'm going to train extra hard. And I'm like, cool, how many extra calories are those? Is that going to burn? Oh, it's going to burn an extra whatever. Let's say 1,400 calories uh, a week. It probably won't, but I'm just picking an easy number. And I go, cool, eat 200 calories extra a day. And they're like, oh, so I need to be in a 200 calorie surplus. And I'm like, no, you've just told me you're going to burn 1400 extra. So all I'm doing is providing extra calories to get you back to maintenance because you'd be in a deficit. So when people start to actually, you know, you're not eating maintenance calories for someone who trains not hard, you're eating maintenance calories for, and, and I'm not a uh, training specialist in any way, shape or form. I have a above average knowledge of it, but I'm not, you know, a geek. But as I understand it, one of the big discussions in the training world is this thing of like max recoverable volume. And I don't even know what people debate on this thing. You know, all the debates, let's be honest, most of them are pointless. Everyone yeah. kind of mostly agrees on everything. And, and, I remember when there was like the protein debate in in the uh, in sort of natural bodybuilding world. And there was like this argument whether people needed, it was something absurd, like, oh, no, I think they need 1.7. And it was like, and the, and the recommendations were like 1.8 to 2.2. But someone was like arguing that it's 1.7. It's like, who cares? Yeah. Like you're arguing over 0.1. It's absurd. So, but anyway, you've got this thing, match recoverable volume. Cool. Train as hard as you can and continue to recover. Fine. That's where we're starting. Now eat enough calories for that. Making sure your protein is set up in the way that we understand probably is necessary for optimal muscle gain. And then you end up at this discussion. Well, okay. Any extra calories puts in a calorie surplus. And this is where we get towards this, this, this word of bulking. You know, people use the word lean bulk. Some people use the word dirty bulk, which is a bit weird. Um, but 
this is where we start to teeter with the ratio of muscle gain to fat gain. And, you know, you'll get people going like, you need to be in a 500 calorie surplus. And, you know, again, the, the energetics of, of, of all these things, it's a dynamic system. So you put people in a thousand calorie surplus and some, some people like this, there, there's massive genetic differences. And, and some of that podcast, I based it on the fact that there's the data often or sometimes alludes to the fact that maybe women don't respond as well to excess calories as their male uh, counterparts do. So um, the difference between two individuals of like feeding 10,000 calories, uh, sorry, an extra thousand calories a day is like a tenfold difference in the amount of fat that they'll gain. So it's, it's huge. Um, and then the, the data, and again, there's not loads of studies, but it, it would seemingly suggest that maybe, and, and for instance, there's a study, uh, the guy who does all the neat research, um, Levine, Levine, he does loads of the non-exercise activity, thermogenesis stuff. Um, all of the female subjects, <clears throat> and I think it was a small study, maybe, you know, less than 20 people, but all of the female subjects were the ones who, uh, whose NEAT increased by the least amount. And all, all subjects were trying to be overfed by a thousand calories. So, and, and again, um, I can't remember the study, but again, I, I think I talked about this in my podcast, the older, older females, older women may be adapting less. So, so for instance, in this thousand calorie surplus, some individuals, non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So we're just talking about wasted energy, really, to put it super simply, just an increase in all different random things like fidgeting and just anything that's not planned exercise really comes under this hugely broad banner of um, neat, which I don't like, but that's a different story. Um, but like five, five to 600 extra calories, some individuals would, um, would, would be lost it, it, with regards to neat for some of these individuals, which is a huge amount. But then, on the other end of the spectrum, you've got people just hardly any of the um, calories going to going to be wasted and dissipated as heat and that, those kind of things. They're just all being stored. So there there is a big in, inter individual variation, you know, in what we're discussing here. And so people, you know, some people, oh, I added in five hundred calories and I didn't really gain much fat. Cool, you know, for you, brilliant. And and that's my message is one you should just monitor like but two ask yourself am i willing to get more fat and for these types of individuals who are contacting me they they within within you know a few paragraphs it was quite clear of conversation it was quite clear to me they had no intention or had no interest in gaining any fat they did not want to do that that was you know their sole goal was was being in a smaller body and so i said to them like forget bulking bulking is not what you're after here like maybe just get yourself out of a deficit for, for a bit if if progress has slowed massively and you're not really enjoying what you're doing get yourself out of a deficit <clears throat> jump back up to what would be your current maintenance calories um you know look to get your calories towards what would be your predicted maintenance calories for your age body weight body fat whatever equation you're going to use and try and maximize your training volume. Try and train really well. Get your protein to a good level. Like you can try and build some muscle in that time if you want. You probably will gain some lean body mass. We're not necessarily talking about myofibrillar proteins that you'll be gaining, but you may, um, you know, lean body mass comes in, in many different forms, not least of all, you know, muscle glycogen, et cetera. So, do that for a bit. Cool. Gain some muscle for a bit. Give give yourself a, you know, if you've got dieting fatigue, give yourself, uh, you know, 
more nutrients, you know, eat, eat more foods, more variety of foods you maybe haven't been able to while you've been restricting. And then reassess because what you're telling me is you want to have X, Y, Z definition. And that definition is going to come from fat loss, not gaining loads of muscle. You'd need to gain uh, an inordinate amount, amount of muscle to push through your fat to give you this curve that you've seen on someone on a picture that's probably not even got that curve. It's a filter uh, and uh, Photoshop. Uh, and don't take yourself further away from your goal by, you know, quote unquote, bulking. Yeah, no, I, I love all those suggestions. And kind of like you mentioned, I think the big thing is like just getting out of a deficit for a period of time, I think is so important for these people. And I also, you know, I'm kind of curious to hear your thoughts on this, but I think it comes down to like a lot of these people too, they, they just been like dieting for like fat loss for so long. And, and the way that they go about like their training and stuff like that too, is kind of like counterintuitive to putting on muscle as well. Right. So you mm -hmm. kind of get this recipe of like, you keep doing that and like, you just don't have this look that you're going far, but it's also because of the way that you're like, I think maybe these people are just very focused on like seeing the scale weight go down. And for them, anything outside of that is, is very scary. But what I like about this is like, essentially the big things, the big takeaways that I, that I got from it was at the very least, you know, just maybe there's probably a lot of benefit to you getting out of a deficit for a period of time, especially if you've been, if you've been doing that for a while. And then, you know, before you decide to just add in all these extra calories, like work on your sleep, you know, maybe improve your training a little bit, like you know, get a little bit more nutrients. Don't be like focused on seeing the scale go down. And that essentially is kind of what you need to do first before you decide, Hey, you know what? I need to build muscle. So now I'm, now I'm going to go into this big bulk. Cause I feel like people think it's either, or it's like, Hey, I either need to be dieting for fat loss or I need either need to be building muscle. It's mm -hmm. like, you don't necessarily have to go either way. Like with that. Right. And I like that on the podcast, you brought up fat loss is energy dependent. Whereas like muscle growth is more like signal dependent. And that's cool because yeah. that shows you that you don't necessarily have to just like force feed yourself to, to, to build muscle. Yeah. Yeah. And it's cool that you bring that up actually, because that's, it is another area that I uh, maybe don't tend towards talking about instantly, but it's, <clears throat> you know, eat, once you have done this for a bit, you want to be eating for fat loss and training for muscle gain. It's, I think you kind of alluded to it there that sometimes people can start training for fat loss and whether, you know, what that means to them, toning exercises or doing super high volume of training, or I'm going to do circuits, um, which, you know, these things won't necessarily lead to the types of physiques that maybe they're, or at least definitely not the ones that they're sending me that they want to look like. They need to be fueling training and training in a much more intelligent way for for their goals specifically for their goals of you know not doing circuit training or whatever and actually doing muscle building type training and um yeah the, I, I didn't really go into some of the stuff but you're right even sleep wise going back to somewhere around maintenance maybe it does improve their sleep it very often does if they've just been on this constant hamster wheel of fat loss and you know they go back to maintenance you know almost certainly improve nutrient intake often getting yourself out of an energy deficit improve sleep and getting out of an energy deficit like i mentioned <clears throat> is super suboptimal for muscle gain and that is due to this plethora of effects it has on various different hormones so this whole like well-studied area of relative energy deficiency um you know previously it was like the female athlete triad but it became a bit more inclusive because it you know obviously includes males as well um but all of you know thyroid being suppressed testosterone being lower you know all these different things that um are going to improve when you go back up to maintenance calories again staying away from discussion of necessarily a surplus of calories but yeah off off the dieting bandwagon get training better benefit from all these things you know after two weeks of a diet break whatever of just eating you know at maintenance calories we do get a recovery of some of the suppression of energy expenditure so 
you know, a suppression of, uh, you know, not that non-exercise activity thermogenesis is lower or gets lowered when we're dieting. So we regain some of that, whether or not that puts us in a long-term better position is again, a different discussion, but at least we start back from square one and then we can, when appropriate or when we want to jump back into a deficit if if needed if wanted and you know you can make progress again with you know from a from a, a different you know a leaner but different starting point of actually i've got my metabolism back a teeny bit my training is going really well at the minute uh, my sleep's better i've been had a higher intake of various micro and macronutrients for a while um yeah it, it all just it's all one big interplay <laughs> Yeah. And, and I mean, you get more food too, which, I mean, that's, that's awesome too, right? Like that, that yeah. flexibility is nice. That gets you to not stress about that. But uh, like, like you said, though, it is like maintenance is very, there's a lot of inter-individual variability there with that, because like you said, what the big thing I took from that too, is like, it, it seems like based on the small research from what you said is that women tend to uh, not upregulate their need or things like that when they are in a, in a surplus. And, and, when you brought it up on the podcast, you kind of talked about from like evolutionary uh, biology, I think is what it was. It's like, it kind of makes sense, right? Like they basically for female for the, with those extra calories, like they're going to use that towards like reproduction essentially. Right. Where it's like, Hey, you got to make sure you have enough energy coming in for that. And I, I imagine that females probably store body fat a little bit more than the males do um, in general. There, and, so. and yeah. And th- this is the thing as well is it's not to say that there isn't huge variation between the individual sexes as well like some some men will have a high propensity for fat gain and yeah. it but it, it but in general yeah we have women uh, seemingly protect body fat stores to a greater extent you know in the animal models I, i'm not a big fan of animal research at all but occasionally i find my like a guilty pleasure going and having a bit of a look because you just get such more profound results and sometimes quite interesting results but you know in the animal research you 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 compare like rodent models of of energy restriction and you you starve essentially male and female rodents and the male rodents just get super lean and their appetite goes crazy and they they are super super hungry so then you put um food back in the equation and they gorge and they gain the body weight whereas the female animals just kind of stop moving and they their appetite doesn't change in the same way that the males do and then so which almost i don't like people using logic ever with these very complex or you know human beings and even just mammals or just organisms in general but it's it's what we kind of see quite often with clients is just like you you know starving female clients they move less this it's not a great idea um and you know male clients male bodybuilders natural bodybuilders i've worked with or you know myself when i was competing it's like yeah you get lean and your hunger goes absolutely crazy through the roof and you know as soon as you put food back in you recover that body weight back um but yes so it's just this case of uh there will be individual variations. So some women will be able to add calories and they will, they will move around more and they will waste some of those calories and they will be able to do a, a bit like the discussions around reverse dieting. Uh, and ve- very often, lots of the discussions around reverse dieting, someone said to me the other day, you know, look at this, look at what this person's saying. They say, you know, they're eating 2000 calories and then they started reverse dieting and got themselves out of a deficit and they added all these calories back in. And now they're, now they're maintaining on 2,800 calories. And I'm like, look at their training. And you know, all that, all that's happening is they're just training more and they're just absolutely beasting it in the gym. I can't remember if they were CrossFitter or something. And, and when you've got high energy output, you, you know, which isn't just neat. It's, it's not like this, like a normal non CrossFit freak, um it's just a normal human being uh they they don't just burn loads of extra calories they don't just randomly start fidgeting and walking more like if they've got a desk job they might fidget teeny bit more but it's not burning loads of extra calories so any athletes i've worked with yeah often you increase calories in the diet and you know training quality just improves massively which 
burns more calories. So they're able to, to do that. And uh, just as an aside, you, there's a, is Mike Dolce is his name. I think it's him. I uh, want like one of these nutrition kind of gurus and not in a good way for kind of sh- uh, MMA type athletes, combat athletes, but essentially going like, yeah, what we do is we change their diet and they, we get them eating six meals a day to boost their metabolism. And they're on a training camp and they go from 2000 calories to 3000 calories a day, but look, they're losing all this body fat. And, but then this, this guy, he's literally joined a training camp prior to a big fight. And it, and he's gone from training like one hour a day to six hours a day. And it's like, well duh it's like you haven't done anything magical all of the research shows that you're an idiot and don't know what you're talking about because we know that whether someone eats once or 13 times a day it doesn't change their metabolism um and that's via the absolute gold standard doubly labeled watered methods like no one's arguing that point with any intelligence um but yeah like if someone's training volume and training quality and everything goes up with more calories yeah, they can maintain on a higher number of energy intake, but it's just their output's gone up a boatload. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's really good. And right, yeah, it's not that six meals is better. It's just, hey, they're training way more, so their energy expenditure is, is, is yeah. way up. Uh, it's it's crazy. You definitely have to be careful in, in, in today's world with, with the internet in terms of where you get your information from. Um, yeah. But that stuff's easier to promote, I feel like, than actual si- oh. science-backed stuff. So it really is. Um, also, Martin, I feel like we, we summed that up pretty well. Was there any other, like maybe take home points there that you would like to, to share with the audience, like on this, on this topic specifically on the bulking topic? Yes, sir. Um, I don't think so. I think we've, uh, no, unless you think there's anything I've missed. I, no. I feel like it's been a good summary for people. And as just, I suppose for people just saying, Yes, I've focused or we've focused a bit on females there, but the same, a lots of the same applies for males. Like it is a common issue that people gain a lot of weight, think that they're gaining a lot of muscle because their shirt's tighter in places they want it to be tighter on the arms, on their chest, whatever. And they think, oh, look at all this muscle I'm gaining. And they, you know, they still, you know, m- metrics that they use to define their leanness, like, bicep vein or uh you know whatever abs you know i I remember the first ever dexter i had done i was 23 percent body fat and i'd been bulking but i i have a very lean naturally lean midsection particularly around my sort of serratus and obliques so i in a side shot it's like geez you're shredded you've got you know visible uh obliques and it's i just I have a very uh, unique, I guess, fat distribution and and where I hold my adipose tissue. So um, it's just worth bearing in mind that you may, because what happens is then they then diet down and they've got only gained one, two, whatever pounds of muscle. And they're like, oh man, I lost, I must be dieting wrong. I'm losing all the muscle that I gain on my bulks until you just take a step back and look at realistic rates of muscle gain and you just go, God, this bulking thing is not all it's cracked up to be. Like you're just gaining loads of fat and coming back to where, you know, let's say you do six months bulk, six months diet and you lose, and you gain whatever. Let's, let's go small. You gain 12 pounds in the six months. People gain way more than this. I, I feel feel like uh, but and then they lose 11 or let's say they lose they, they diet down 10 pounds it's like look over a year i gained two pounds oh and, and they're upset and versus this guy who just gains it, you know just eats at maintenance give or take and at the end of the year he's two pounds heavier but the same body fat and he's gained two pounds of muscle like that that's not too far from the truth that's not too far from what the realistic situation of what happen um and so it just you know do what you want to do bulking can be fun it's nice sometimes but we're talking about males and females here uh bulking hard definitely i just would really just recommend against 
it's outdated. I, I, I'm glad you brought that up because I think that, you know, telling people like just being honest with them, being like muscle growth is such a slow process. And I don't think people can comprehend that. So they think that by eating more and eat and whatnot, like that weight that they're gaining is more muscle. It's like, you just, you mm. can't, you can't really cheat the system. Like you, like you said earlier, right. It's not energy no, dependent, can't. like, like fat loss is right. And so I think yeah. people aren't patient with it and they think that they can make this process go faster by just eating more. But it's like, you, you have to, you have to be careful with that because like you said, you get in that situation where you gain a bunch of body fat. And then at the end of the day, it's like, you, you're just kind of, when you're fat loss phase, you're just kind of working on getting rid of all that body fat that you gained yeah. or not much muscle. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Martin, I appreciate your time. Uh, I want to be respectful of your time. We've been uh, at this for a little over an hour now. So uh, before I let you go, though, is there anywhere where you would like the audience to find you? And I know you mentioned they can also email about uh, Mac University as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, if people want to find me, I'm always, you know, Facebook and Instagram, Martin Nutrition. Uh, they can find me there. I'm, I'm very active. I, I do my very best. It's not entirely possible to to just kind of respond to DMs, but I do question boxes and stuff that people can use to get my attention. Uh, and then I've got my website, martin-mcdonald.com, which has all of you know my podcast episodes on there. And um, I go to the extent of posting all of the references from studies I mentioned and, and stuff. But, you know, I, I feel like I work quite hard on it. And, um, and then, yeah, mac-nutritionuni.com is the one if anyone wants to you know, take their nutrition knowledge, get a new qualification that is, you know, become, you know, quickly becoming, I guess, the gold standard in the health and fitness industry uh, and go on the website, read up on it, get contact us if you need um, any questions answering and we'll do our best to help you out. Awesome. Yeah. And also I'll, I'll link the uh, episode 28 of the podcast as well, of your ah, podcast cool. so people can check out that, uh, that episode if they want to kind of get like just your thoughts on it and probably a little bit more in depth detail on it. So uh, again, Martin, appreciate your time and uh, we'll chat with you soon. Mm, thanks, Jeff. Thanks for having me.